Mexico is one of the three countries with the highest rates of adult obesity. According to data from the 2012 National Health and Nutrition Survey, the combined prevalence of overweightness and obesity in men and women over 20 years of age is above 70%. Overweightness and obesity can cause high blood pressure, high cholesterol and triglyceride levels, heart disease, diabetes, cerebrovascular accidents and several kinds of cancer. Six point four million people in Mexico have diabetes, and it is one of the main causes of death. Mexico holds first place in the world in infant obesity. Paradoxically, many of these obese children suffer from malnutrition. Increased physical activity, an adequate diet, and weight loss are the keys to preventing diabetes or controlling this disease when it occurs. Researchers at the Center for Scientific Research in Yucatan believe that part of the solution to this problem lies in reappraising, recreating, and disseminating traditional diets whose original characteristics are safeguarded by people with knowledge of the ancient recipes of the Mesoamerican diet. These researchers affirm that the diets of Mexico's traditional peoples are characterized by variety, a key feature of healthy nutrition, that this variety reflects the high degree of biological and cultural diversity associated with those cultures, and that native populations are genetically adapted to traditional diets. Traditional alimentary cultures are losing ground to monotonous diets that are rich in saturated fats, fiber-free flours, sugar, and carbohydrates with low protein content, all promoted by large globalized industries in the form of hundreds of processed foods. One example of a traditional diet that has been successfully reappraised and promoted in modern times comes from the Mediterranean area. It was recently recognized by the UNESCO as intangible cultural patrimony of humanity. Its best known elements are olives, grapes, and wheat. Traditional Mexican cooking has also been recognized as patrimony of humanity as a fundamental element of the cultural identity of the communities that practice it. Today, we need to become more familiar with this diet in all its dimensions and original structure in order to reevaluate the nutritional and ecological balance it offers and promote it in every sector of the population as a means of combating health problems and the loss of biological and cultural diversity in Mexico. It is for these reasons that three biologists, Daniel Sisumbo, Patricia Colunga, and Alondra Flores, consider it important to investigate the origins of the Mesoamerican diet and the consequences that its development has had on Mexican populations throughout history. Their results suggest that the creation of this diet may predate the invention of pottery, the origins of agriculture, and the domestication of plants in Mesoamerica. Together with South America, the Near East, and Northern China, Mesoamerica is one of the four oldest primary centers of plant domestication in the world. The development of high pre-Hispanic cultures in countries like Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica was based on the exploitation of a series of agricultural products that included corn, beans, squash, chili peppers, tomato, and green tomato, among other species that would later be domesticated and integrated into an agroalimentary system called milpa cultivation.
Over a period of several thousand years, this agroelementary system achieved an advanced equilibrium in both nutritional and ecological terms. Corn provides carbohydrates and energy. Beans were the principal source of protein. Squash seeds were the main source of fats. And chili peppers, tomato and green tomato supplied vitamins and minerals. While each region added locally available plants, the common denominator of this complex alimentary system consisted of corn, beans, squash and chili peppers, the first three of which formed a complementary triad in terms of their ecological relations. The corn stalks provided support for the bean plants that grew among them, allowing them to climb high enough to reach the sun's rays. In return, beans enrich the soil by providing the nitrogen that corn and squash plants require. Squash, in turn, produces cucurbitacins, substances that are toxic to herbivores and so erect a natural barrier that protects all three crops. With the arrival of Europeans, this agroalimentary system based on corn, beans, squash and chili peppers was complemented by other cultivated species that were important in the region, as well as more than 70 wild plant and animal species. This was primarily a vegetarian diet, but one in which species like turkey, deer, wild boar and insects constituted complementary sources of proteins and animal fat. But when might this Mesoamerican diet, that sustained such great civilizations and has been declared historical patrimony of humanity, have been constituted? Three researchers, Patricia Colunga, Daniel Sisumbo, and Alondra Flores, believe that part of the answer to this question will emerge from studies of the oldest dishes of the Mesoamerican diet that is extant today, dishes derived from the wild ancestors of the plants that now form the basis of people's alimentary system and that can be elaborated without pottery vessels, that is, without ceramic pots or griddles. Por los resultados de nuestra investigación, pensamos que esta dieta pudo haberse originado antes de que los humanos que habitaron Mesoamérica hubieran inventado las ollas y los comales de barro y antes de que se hubieran organizado en pueblos y ciudades. Es más, pensamos que pudo haberse originado antes de que desarrollaran el sistema agrícola conocido como milpa y la domesticación de sus especies. O sea que la dieta mesoamericana básica pudo haberse conformado al inicio del periodo arcaico, que es como se le conoce al periodo de tiempo transcurrido de las últimas glaciaciones al surgimiento de las civilizaciones mesoamericanas. This is the volcano of Colima, also called the volcano of fire. It is located in the extreme western area of Mesoamerica. It is Mexico's most active volcano. It forms part of a mountain chain called Cantero Nevado Volcán de Fuego. The continuous lava flows and the formation of this volcanic chain between 18,000 and 4,000 years before the present, caused the geographical separation of floristic elements of the Balsas Jalisco region, leaving the extreme western area with a rich variety of species and populations that are the wild relatives of domesticated corn, beans, squash, and chili peppers.
Researchers have found scientific evidence indicating that corn, beans, squash, and perhaps other species now included in the Mesoamerican diet may have been domesticated in this area. In the area around the volcano of Colima today, some human populations still practice traditional milpa agriculture. This region is surrounded by three natural protected areas, the Sierra de Manantlan Biosphere Reserve, the Navarro de Colima National Park, and the private El Jabalí Reserve. It was for these reasons that these three scientists selected this area for intensive study. Esta es la zona en donde nosotros estamos estudiando y está eh, está es conocida como el llano que fue inmortalizada en el cuento de Juan Rulfo como el llano en llamas. Esta zona es un reservorio muy importante biológico, particularmente relacionado a las plantas domesticadas en, en Mesoamérica, como son el maíz, el frijol, la calabaza, los chiles. Aquí encontramos la mayor riqueza de las especies del género sea. Tenemos tres especies, eh, también de otro género relacionado que es Tripsacum, cinco especies, así como los progenitores silvestres de, los, de tres especies de frijol, eh, así como las calabazas. Once the study area was defined, the course of our research led us to pose this question. What was the most remote period in which the Mesoamerican diet could have been formed? The search for answers began with the early arrival of human groups in Mesoamerica, which took place around 10,600 years ago. In the early Holocene, between 11,000 and 10,000 years before the present, temperatures and rainfall increased, as did the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In contrast, springtime brought a prolonged period of drought before the onset of the rainy season, an annual climatic pattern that continues today. In the study area, this climate change propitiated the establishment of low deciduous forests. In this type of forest, most trees lose their leaves during the dry season, a condition that propitiates the occurrence of natural fires. This was the scenario that favored the development of the main plants in the Mesoamerican diet. Plants that responded positively to the perturbations caused by fire, namely species of wild corn, beans, squash, chili peppers, and tomato. At the same time as climatic change was taking place, 
Groups of hunter-gatherers from the Great Plains arrived in Mesoamerica between 10,600 and 10,000 before the present. There is evidence from the study area of these human groups that had the technological adaptations for gathering plants and hunting small fauna in the basin of the sayula sacualco Lake System and in the Coahuayana River Basin. The researchers Daniel Zizumbo and Patricia Colunga found large fixed stones modified by human hands that may have been used as tools to break up and grind grains at sites like Tetapan, Tel Cruz, Comala, Almaloyan, and La Campana during the Archaic period. The methods for transforming foods that these groups utilized included three stone hearths, earth ovens, grinding stones, and perhaps hollows in stones used for fermentation. These researchers believe that those groups of hunter-gatherers may have been the creators of the Mesoamerican diet due to their ample experience from ancient times in gathering plants, their consumption of ground grains, stems, and the bases of agave shoots cooked underground, as well as fruits and seeds of mesquite, nopal, and oak. Human groups in the plains area also brought a second very efficient technology for transforming the natural environment, fire. By the year 10,500 BP, paleoecological records indicate that fire was being utilized systematically in the Balsas Jalisco region. La presencia del fuego natural o inducida favorece la presencia de varias especies, particularmente las especies que rebrotan y las especies que son tolerantes al fuego. Por ejemplo, vemos los pastos. Es una comunidad de pastos que resulta favorecida después del fuego y que se convierte en un recurso muy importante de alimento para la fauna que eventualmente puede ser cazada. Entre las gramíneas que resultaron más favorecidas encontramos las especies de los géneros Sea y del, y del género Tripsacum que están emparentadas a los, al cultivo del maíz. Human groups intentionally set fires in the dry season to create zones where plants and grasses would re-sprout as a way to attract deer, peccaries, and other animals. When the animals approached to eat the tender shoots, they would fall into traps prepared by the hunters, who then used them as food and sources of hides. The use of fire had a double effect, for it not only allowed people to attract animal prey, but also propitiated abundant populations of wild corn, beans, squash, and tomatoes that were easy to gather, thus intensifying the alimentary relationship with those species. Having identified the human groups that may have initiated agriculture, and that had the knowledge required to transform grains and fruits provided by the low deciduous forest, the researchers intensified their work in the study area. Nos preguntábamos si para el 10500 antes del presente estos grupos humanos que habitaban el occidente de Mesoamérica pudieran haber creado lo básico de la dieta mesoamericana con las especies que estaban a su alrededor y con las técnicas de transformación de alimentos que conocían incluso antes de su entrada a Mesoamérica. Con esta pregunta en mente, nos dimos a la tarea de averiguar en nuestra zona de estudio cuáles eran los platillos que la gente consideraba más antiguos, o sea que ellos supieran que ya se preparaban desde la época de los abuelos de sus abuelos. 
y además que pudieran prepararse con los ancestros silvestres de las especies que hoy en día son la base de la dieta mesoamericana y que los pudieran hacer sin necesidad de ollas y comales de barro. The study involved 45 individuals whose average age was 67 years. They came from eight communities in the study area. The people interviewed were those with the broadest knowledge of ancient dishes. Their responses revealed that in their communities, people still prepare dishes using pre-ceramic or archaic technology, including drying under the sun, roasting on embers, toasting on rocks or in hot embers, grinding grains and seeds with milling stones, soaking in water with ash, maceration with stones, fermentation in the hollows of rocks, and earth ovens. Una vez inventariadas las recetas, nos dimos a la tarea de elaborar los 21 platillos en conjunto con los pobladores locales. Esos platillos fueron los que encontramos pudieron haber conformado la dieta mesoamericana arcaica. Gratamente, la mayoría de estos están vigentes en la cultura local. The researchers reconstructed dishes that may have been essential in the archaic diet by combining basic species from the Mesoamerican diet, but utilizing only ancient food preparation technologies. Toasting wild corn kernels produced popcorn. Pinoles were made by grinding up corn kernels, dried beans, and other toasted seeds into very fine powders. By diluting the pinoles in water, they made atoles, or gruels. Mixing the grains with fermented fruits produced beverages like tejuino, tepache, and tart atole, a thick gruel. By combining the toasted ground seeds of corn and beans and then cooking them in earth ovens, they made tamales. Agave stems were cooked to produce a food called mezcal. The mezcal was then macerated to extract the agave juice that is used to sweeten several dishes. By grinding up squash seeds, they produced what they call curd or mincemeat. And by roasting chili peppers in embers and then combining them with different fruits or seeds, They made salsas and a dish called elephant ear tree chili. The biologists from the Yucatan Center for Scientific Research have scoured the study area for archaeological evidence related to the diet of ancient groups and the technology utilized in food preparation. In the area around the volcanoes of Colima, researchers have found fixed stones modified by human hands at sites like Tel Cruz, Tetapan, Comala, Almaloyan, and La Campana. Located at a spectacular geographical site flanked on one side by a deep ravine and with the volcano of fire as the backdrop, this stone at the Tetapan site represents a true archaic kitchen. Ven Pablo, vamos a, te, voy a, te voy a explicar algunas cosas aquí. Mira, esto lo podemos considerar como una cocina arcaica donde tenemos varios implementos para la obtención de jugos, de harinas. Estás en un sitio privilegiado porque hacia el norte tienes a los volcanes y hacia el sur tienes al Cerro Grande. Estás en medio de dos grandes ríos de corrientes de agua, uno que drena toda el área del llano y otro que donde bajan los escurrimientos de las nieves durante el invierno y tienes agua fresca abajo. Entonces este sitio es muy importante porque por una parte es un sitio en donde puedes obtener tu comida, pero por otro lado te sitúa 
en el universo, en la Tierra. Entonces, ¿aquí qué siento? O sea, aquí lo que tienes son diferentes instrumentos para transformar los alimentos, ¿no? Llegan los granos y haces harinas. Llegan los frutos esos muy duros y los quebras. Por ejemplo, aquí tienes uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco sitios en donde tú puedes estar tamulando seis con ese. Pues puede haber seis personas aquí al mismo tiempo tamulando los frutos de la, de la ciruela. Y tienes tres grandes depósitos en el centro donde todos esos jugos se están drenando. Ahora, ¿por qué sí fue importante el jugo de la ciruela? Porque con el jugo de la ciruela se hacían bebidas fermentadas. Y a partir de las bebidas fermentadas, por una parte era un alimento de mayor riqueza nutricional y por otro lado se producía alcohol y también para las personas jugó un papel muy importante en, en, tanto en la alimentación como en la religión. Ahora, por este otro lado tienes un área, amplia área, de molienda. O sea, tienes integrados dos tipos de metates, ¿verdad? Puedes tener dos personas, al mismo tiempo están, estar moliendo los granos que puedes estar colectando de tu entorno. Entonces, todos los instrumentos están integrados en esta roca. One of the basic plants included in the Mesoamerican diet grows in the low deciduous forest. It's called agave. When they mature, the agave plants send up an enormous flowered mast that can be several meters tall. In this region, it's called the quiote. In the community of Tetapan, members of the Pineda family eat the mast or quiote. The mast can be eaten either cooked in an earth oven or roasted over embers. This roasting technique was quite common in the archaic period and has endured down to the present in the study area as a method for cooking various grains and fruits. Although people today think of popcorn as a particularly modern snack food often consumed in movie theaters, these researchers believe that archaic groups may have consumed popcorn thousands of years ago, preparing it with the help of hot ashes from a hearth. Even today, people in the study area preserve the custom of toasting a variety of grains using this archaic technique. Shortly after the teosintle seeds are placed among the hot ashes, they begin to pop. It's time to take the popcorn out of the hot ashes so that it doesn't burn. El consumo de palomitas en el área de estudio era muy común hasta hace unas cinco décadas. La elaboración era realizada tanto por hombres como por mujeres. Some people recall that, although ceramic pots were used to prepare popcorn, they also used hot ashes to make the corn kernels pop. No, pues no, mi mamá no las hacía así en la olla, con, con ceniza. Colaba la ceniza, antes había cerrazos de, de, de esos de, que tienen palo y cerdas abajo. Ya los han visto, ¿verdad? 
en de esos, no, no, colaba la ceniza a mi mamá para que no tuviera carbón, no tuviera algo. Y ahí los, ahí hacía las palomitas ella. Y como nosotros teníamos muchos cajones de abejas, les requemaba miel mi mamá y, y no les ponía. Pero así no las comía, no, no, no hacía. Ella sabía hacer como el piso Filomena, Ponte Duro. También bola sabía hacer, pero, pero en el mismo rato, así calientito, calentaba la miel y ya nos daba, ya comían mis palomitas. The toasting technique in hot ashes is not only used to make popcorn with no need for oil, but also for toasting wild bean, squash, and elephant ear tree seeds. In the community of Tetapan, Don Chayo harvests seeds using a hook made from two otate shoots that he tied together so he can reach the highest branches of the elephant ear tree. When the seed pods fall, he gathers them in a sack made of sisal fiber. Don Chayo beats the seeds inside the sack with a stick of otate to separate the seeds from the dry pods. Next, he gathers up the loose seeds and carries them to the hearth where they will be toasted in the hot ashes. The seeds have to be moved continuously until they pop to separate the seed coat from the seeds themselves. Con la semilla de la parota, cuando ella se asona, que empieza a caer, hay que variarla. Después de variarla, ya guardo yo mi parota variada. Entonces de ahí ya voy sacando como yo la voy ocupando y ya la tengo que, que tatemar. La tengo que poner en la, en la ceniza caliente y ya saco mis parotitas. The toasted seeds can be eaten directly or mixed into a variety of dishes. Doña Lupe, Don Chayo's wife, grinds up the seeds in a metate to prepare a salsa made from elephant ear tree seeds. It's called elephant ear seed salsa. The flour or pinole produced is then crowned up with roasted chili peppers and a little water to give the salsa the right consistency. se muele la parota pero ya dorada ¿eh? ya como ahorita que la doraron ya los que salen así sin cáscara ya pues las muele uno y pues con sal y chile nomás y que ya va al comerse pues le pone un limón y más me gustaba el chile de parota que hacía mi mamá bien bueno espesito porque lo vi acá chirrito ¿verdad? y ahí de mi mamá lo hacía bien espesito Y lo cuando íbamos a lavar a la barranca, hacía taquitos de, de chile de parota, así, ¿no? por lado, de espesito, espesito, salía, no se tiraba. Elephant ear seed salsa is a dish that may be the main course of a meal. It's considered highly nutritious. Like their domesticated cousins, the toasted seeds of wild corn can be used to produce a powder called pinole, a kind of whole corn flour that is sweetened by combining it with ground seeds of wild anise plants. In addition to large fixed stones, 
individual stones of various shapes and sizes were used. En la zona de estudio se encuentran fácilmente estas piedras, que sus formas más rústicas son conocidas como huilanches. Algunas son verdaderas piezas arqueológicas que han sido encontradas por los pobladores locales y las reutilizan en sus cocinas. Corn pinole is a food in itself, one considered to have high nutritional value that provides energy. It lasts a long time without spoiling, so it is traditionally used on long trips. Other seeds that are toasted to make pinole or flour come from beans, squash, chan, and elephant ear trees. When water is added to corn pinole, the product is called atole de pinole, or pinole gruel. Water can be added to pinole made from ground squash seeds to make a drink called horchata. A small amount of water is added to pinole made of chan seeds and the mixture is left to thicken. Finally, corn pinole is added to produce a drink called bate. Yo no lo sé hacer así como ella lo hacía. Ella tostaba el chan y lo molía en el metate y hacía un cuero grandote así y molía pinole pues de maíz y revolvía los pedazos de este del de, cuero de, de chan lo revolvía con el pinole y a pur meniada lo desbarataba ese es el era el el bate que se hacía antes y ahora lo hacemos nomás molemos el chan y lo batemos y ya pero no usaba no usamos el el pinole pues These three refreshing drinks are especially popular during the hot months. Traditionally, they're sweetened with agave juice. El jarabe de agave, junto con la miel de las abejas nativas, era el endulzante tradicional por excelencia. Y hoy sabemos que su consumo en cantidades moderadas y obtenido bajo el sistema tradicional de cocimiento lento es mucho más sano que consumir el azúcar de caña o la alta fructosa de maíz que se usa en los alimentos industrializados. Obtenido de la manera tradicional, o sea, por el cocimiento lento de sus cabezas en hornos bajo tierra, su contenido de fructosa y de fibra alimentaria hacen que el jarabe de agave tenga un bajo índice glucémico, o sea, que los niveles de azúcar en sangre después de consumirlo sean mucho más estables que después de consumir azúcar de caña, por ejemplo. In addition to toasting seeds, people also grind them up after soaking them in water. To prepare atole blanco, or white gruel, corn kernels are soaked in water overnight, then the wet kernels are ground up on stones to form a fine paste. The paste is then diluted in water and stirred. This refreshing drink is consumed daily and can be enjoyed year-round, usually in the morning accompanied with salt and chili. Another way to drink it is with the fruit of roasted squash or pieces of cooked agave or mezcal. Viera cuánto mezcal hay allá. Le dicen cimarrón. Y de ese gimaban y lo tatemaban igual como tatemaron las calabazas. Pero nomás para comer. Con la tole blanco. ¿Eh? Así a tole blanco hacen y en el olla y, y el mezcal lo tatemaban. O sea, una o dos bolas o tres. Es que para que durara. Ya pedacito. Con la tole, ¿usted cree? Dura también. 
To prepare tart atole, you also soak the corn kernels. But to obtain the acidic flavor characteristic of this atole, you need to let the kernels ferment. So they're left to soak for several nights, not just one, until they acidify. Today, people only use black corn kernels to make this kind of atole. When enough time has passed, the soaked maize kernels are ground up on a stone. Then the paste obtained is diluted in water before adding panile. El panile se puede elaborar con semillas de una calabaza silvestre conocida localmente como tululunche. Las semillas se lavan con ceniza y agua para quitarlo amargo y poder consumirlas. To produce panile, you first wash the wild squash seeds in ash and water to eliminate the tart taste. Then they have to be diluted in water and strained to remove the ash residue. After that, they're placed under the sun's rays to dry before being toasted on hot ashes. The seeds are ground on a milling stone and the powder obtained is diluted in water again with a bit of salt until the panile is ready. To finish preparing tart atole, the fermented drink is mixed with a little panile and stirred. Traditionally, Tart atole was served with cooked squash to shepherds and elderly men who wore wooden masks and wigs made of sisal fiber during the December festivals. Porque ese es el atole antiguo de la gente de antes. Este La gente de antes este cocía cocía calabaza y o tatemaban calabaza y les daban a los a los pastores o a los viejos en tiempo de, de noviembre y diciembre sí es el antiguo porque la, las personas este lo usaban para darles la gente les decía a los viejos a los que salían con la máscara el el 24 en la noche de diciembre no sé si de noviembre o diciembre Entonces, este, los pastores y todos y la gente les daba de comer. Es una tole que le ponen unos granitos, le ponen salecita. Uh -huh. Y así se lo toma. People in the community of Perempitz also prepare traditional drinks. Doña Valentina begins her daily chores at 5 a.m., including feeding the family and milking the cows. Later, she gets ready to prepare a drink made with fermented corn kernels called tejuino. The corn kernels are soaked in water for at least two nights until they begin to ferment. Doña Valentina grinds up the fermented corn kernels on a stone to produce a coarse dough. Next, she grinds up a bit of cooked agave to obtain the juice used to sweeten the drink. Finally, she adds the agave juice to the coarse dough and mixes it until it has the desired consistency. Tejuino is consumed traditionally not only in the study area, but throughout Western Mexico, where it's still sold as a refreshing drink on the streets of cities like Colima and Guadalajara.
The tapaches include several beverages that have long been popular in the study area. Archaic in origin, their elaboration requires dried or fresh fruit that is allowed to ferment. One of the most traditional tapaches is prepared with plums. Fresh or dried plums are rehydrated in water and left to ferment for several days. This prepared drink has a moderate alcohol content. The use of tapaches and other fermented drinks during the pre-Hispanic period as both a food source and in ceremonies and rituals is well documented in colonial era chronicles written by friars and historians in the New World. In different regions, tapaches are prepared with a variety of fruits and seeds, including plums, mesquite, wild guava, agave, guamara, prickly pear, pitaya, and chucuixtle. La guamara también la he oído mentar. Sí, y también de eso se hace. Se hace tapache. Y esa nosotros la cortábamos del, del racimo, pues son racimotes así y las poníamos a asar en el rescoldo y pues sueltan la gomita y es dulce que es, también nos los comíamos a asar las guámaras One of the most important dishes in the Mesoamerican diet is cooked agave which is rich in carbohydrate complexes such as inulin, a substance that offers great health benefits. Gathering wild agaves is a tradition that has continued up to the present day in the community of Tetapan. Today, people use specialized tools to harvest agaves, a product of a millenarian relation between humans and plants, as can be seen in pottery sculptures from Western Mesoamerica. First, you cut off the shoots to leave the clean head or ball of the agave plant. Then you cut the stem at the root to free the plant before taking it to the earth oven. Cooking in an earth oven is another technique that has been passed down from the archaic period to the present. The oven for cooking mezcal or agave is circular in shape. Its walls may or may not be lined with volcanic rock. The oven has to be preheated with firewood and river rocks, which turn a whitish color when they have reached the correct temperature for cooking. After sealing the oven, the agave balls are left to slow cook for three days. Archaeologists have discovered many ovens of this type in the area around the Volcano of Fire, the Snowy Mountain and the Kalima area. 
evidence of the millenarian existence of this food preparation technique. The oven is uncovered to extract the cooked agave, one of the most important dishes during the archaic period and a principal source of carbohydrates. In this region, people cut the mesonte, the central part of the cooked agave head, where it attaches to the stem, into strips. They can be eaten right away or after drying in the sun, a technique that preserves them for a long time. People also grind up the bases of the cooked agave shoots to obtain a juice that's rich in fructans and non-digestible fibers that were used traditionally to sweeten different dishes. If you let the agave juice ferment for two months in a rock pit, locally known as Pozo de Peña, you obtain an ancient drink called Tepache de Mezcal, or fermented cooked agave juice. It has a low alcohol content and may have been used in rituals in pre-Hispanic times. Today, fermented cooked agave juice is consumed only sporadically, but it is important for distilling a liquor with a high alcohol content called mezcal. In the community of Tel Cruz, Doña Amelia's family is preparing a dish whose name comes from mezcal because one of its principal ingredients is agave juice. This dish is called mezcal tamales. It is made by mixing pinole made from corn with pinole made from wild beans. In order to mix the ingredients well, she adds agave juice and then kneads the dough until it has the right consistency. Doña Amelia makes small balls of dough and wraps them in leaves from wild grape or wild corn plants. Next, she places the tamales in the hot ashes of the hearth. Alternatively, they can be cooked in an earth oven. These tamales were an important food especially for long days spent in the fields or long trips that lasted several weeks. No quedan muy dulces ni muy desabridos, lo más buenos para comerse. Esos tamales se pueden los puede uno, pues ahorita ya hay facilidades de hornearlos. Nosotros antes hacíamos poquitos debajo del comal, metíamos cuando acabábamos de tortear, metíamos los tamales, pero hacíamos como unos 3 litros y nos los repartíamos y duran los tamales. Si hacen duritos, así que diga usted que se acedan, no se acedan. La gente de antes, dicen la gente que iban en bursa hasta México y llevaba cada quien su, su, su bastimento, tamales de, de mezcal. With Doña Amelia's help, the researchers recreated the elaboration of another ancient dish, bean tamales.
Bean tamales are a dish made in large quantities to be eaten by various people. These tamales are wrapped in the large leaves of the so-called tamal tree. Traditionally, they were made by soaking corn kernels in water overnight, though a modern variant uses kernels boiled in water and then grinding them on stones with a little salt to produce a dough. Doña Amelia takes a portion of dough and forms it into a thin round disc that will serve as the base of the tamale. After that, she adds a paste made of toasted bean pinole and water. Then she spreads the bean paste over the corn tortilla to form one layer. This operation is repeated several times until the dish has seven alternating layers of corn and beans. De la masa, así salían de varias capas. Y los amarrábamos con, mez, con vencas de mezcal, correas de mezcal, así, allá en el rancho. Sí, se ven las capas, como es alto el tamal, le corta uno y se figuran todas las capas de frijol y de masa de frijol y masa. De... When the preparation is finished, the tamales are wrapped in leaves from the tamal tree. Allá en, en donde hacíamos los tamales hay una parte que hay mucho árbol con unas hojonas grandes. Y ese es el compañero del tamal. Entonces ya íbamos y cortábamos hojas. Eh, mientras ellas ya tenían los, los, la masa con los frijoles. Y ya ellas sabían cómo iban a hacer los tamales. Y ya nosotros nomás íbamos envolviendo los tamales gruesos con hojas. Finally, the tamales are cooked overnight in an earth oven, or, as in this case, in the hot ashes of the fire pit. A little lower down, in the community of Tel Cruz, the researchers look for information on another ancestral dish with the help of Doña Josefina, tamales de ceniza, or ash tamales. Ceniza, la, para los tamales, ay, como los hacían antes, con ceniza de, de leña de tepame, para que salgan, que con eso sale bien poquito y, y luego, pues, con otro sabor. La preparación del tamal de ceniza consiste en el remojo de los granos de maíz en agua con ceniza por una noche. Posteriormente son lavados con agua para quitar los restos de cenizas. La función de este tipo de remojo es facilitar la molienda. Además, puede ser el antecedente histórico de la nixtamalización. The kernels are ground up on stones with a little salt to make the dough. 
taking a little bit of dough, Doña Josefina makes a thin disc for the outer layer of the tamale. Inside that layer, she adds a paste made of toasted bean pinoli with a little water and then closes the tamale to form a ball. The tamales are wrapped in tilia or wild grape leaves or, as in this case, leaves from wild corn plants. Finally, the bean tamales are cooked in an earth oven overnight. In this region, three different types of earth ovens are utilized. The mezcal oven, the rectangular pit type, and the dome pit type. The rectangular pit oven is rectangular in shape and is used to cook the fruits of squash plants, roots, and tamales, usually overnight. This oven is also used to cook deer and peccary meat and, more recently, to prepare a meat dish made with chili called pit cooked meat. La carne se tatema en la tierra, como ustedes tatemaron la calabaza. Así. Se tatema la carne así y la guarda uno en una olla, se enfría bien y la guarda. Y de allí estás comiendo carne todos los días, a la hora que quieres. Sacas carne y comes. Así hacían. In the community of Perampitz, Don Ubaldo's family still prepares squash, sweet potatoes, and tamales with chili using the dome pit oven. The dome pit oven consists of two chambers. The first is rectangular and larger, while the second is smaller and circular in shape. In the second one, you need to build up a vault made of river stones. First, several people work together to place a row of stones. There's a keystone that serves as a support for all the others. Once a cross-like structure is made, they fill in the holes until the vault is completed. In the other chamber, through a tunnel, they place dry sticks and straw, and then they light them on fire. You have to wait until the rocks get hot. From time to time, Don Ubaldo fans the fire and adds more firewood. When the rocks are red hot, they're knocked over and spread out on the floor of the oven. The fruit of squash plants is then placed right on top of the hot stones. Sometimes, people cook tamales and sweet potatoes in the rectangular chamber at the same time because it isn't as hot since it doesn't receive the fire directly. Both ovens are then covered with a mat made of sticks and a blanket of sisal fibers, or, if those materials aren't available, as in this case, the leaves of agave plants work just as well. Finally, Everything is covered with earth and people wait for around three hours while the food cooks. Yeah. 
when the time required to cook the squash has elapsed, Don Ubaldo and his family and friends uncover the oven. Yo de llegué a ver un horno que le alcanzaban como unas 10 de este tamaño. Entonces, este, pues la gente era muy unida. Este, iban y le decían, me das permiso, se echaron una calabaza para mí y llegaba otro y a mí también. No, que a mí también, no, que a mí, a la mía le voy a poner una T porque me llamo Teresa y, y, y yo me llamo María, le voy a poner una M. Así no se revuelven. When hard times come and food becomes scarce, one important survival strategy is food preservation using the drying technique under the sun's rays on drying beds made of otate. Entonces el instrumento más importante aquí es la cama de secado, que es elaborado o es hecha con los tallos de otate, este entre tejidos con las fibras del agave. Es instalada en los, en los patios, en los solares cerca de las, de las casas o incluso en los bosquetes de ciruelos o de, guam, o de guamuchiles en donde se cosechan y se ponen a secar. Posteriormente des, del secado se encostalan y entonces son guardadas y pueden ser aprovechadas durante todo el año. Ya por ejemplo mi abuelita ya tenía que, que guardar uños de guamuchiles para que se secaran y ya pues podían durar meses ahí, ya cuando ella los limpiaba, ya tiraba las cáscaras, ya nomás dejaba la puro, los puros guamuchiles. Y ya en sus bolsitas de bule guardaba y, y llenaba de guamuchiles sus, bols, su, sus jícaras así de bule. Y ya cuando ella quería, cuando ya no había guamuchiles, ella agarraba un puño y lo remojaba y hacía sopa. Products that are sun-dried include plums, guamuchiles, mesquite, wild guava, mojo, guava fruit, tomatoes, and foods such as mesonte, the stems of cooked agaves. El ciruelo, por ejemplo, es muy importante para toda la, esta cultura en Occidente de México. ¿Por qué? Porque una vez seca, y encostalada y guardada, posteriormente es utilizada para hacer atoles, bebidas fermentadas, incluso licor. Con las ciruelas también, las utilizamos haciendo que atole de ciruela, este, conserva de ciruela, o nos las comemos también maduras con tortilla y con frijoles, o verdes con frijoles machucadas, asadas, pues y saldrán buen sabor a los frijoles, ya le revuelve uno algo. Other dishes basic to the Mesoamerican diet and that complemented it nutritionally were the salsas, whose main ingredient was chili peppers. One of the basic salsas is made by grinding up chili peppers with wild green tomatoes and salt. Other salsas are made with chili peppers, tomato, plums, agrito, elephant ear seeds, and guaje, all of which can be ground up either when they're fresh or cooked. When combined with all these other foods, the salsas complement the alimentary scheme of the Mesoamerican diet.
del chile de la parota, mi mamá, de las parotas secas que estaban, ya. La, a, como hay en las cenicitas, las ponía y también revientan como el maíz reventador. Y ya con eso las molía ahí con su chile y ya. Pero ese a mí no me gustaba. Nomás a mi mamá y luego el chile de ciruela. También le gustaba bien mucho a mi mamá. As we have seen, the human groups that settled in the Balsas Jalisco region around 10,600 years before the present may well have been the ones who created the Mesoamerican diet. The use of fire to attract the animals they hunted propitiated an increase in wild populations of corn, beans, and squash, and that made it possible for them to create an agroalimentary system between 10,600 and 4,000 years ago that played a fundamental role in the development of the great civilizations that emerged in Mesoamerica. The results of this research suggest that by combining six basic species, those peoples were able to elaborate at least 21 dishes that included different kinds of pinoles, atoles, tepaches, tamales, and salsas. The fact that people in the study region still consume the wild ancestors of plants that are central to the Mesoamerican diet, that they eat them in dishes that are basic to this diet, and that all these dishes can be prepared with no need for ceramic pots or griddles, but using only pre-ceramic techniques that were available since the arrival of humans in America are the three fundamental conditions that lead the researchers Daniel Sisumbo, Patricia Colunga, and Alondra Flores to believe that the basic Mesoamerican diet is of archaic origin. Moreover, these facts allow them to reach the conclusion that this diet could have emerged even before the invention of pottery making, before the traditional system of milpa cultivation developed, and before the principal plants involved were domesticated. That is, before peasant farmers began the process of selecting certain plants harvest after harvest until they achieved the forms that we know today. La importancia de estos hallazgos para la salud de la población nativa y la población mestiza de este país, que somos la mayoría, es que significa que nuestras adaptaciones biológicas a nuestra dieta son muy antiguas. Y es por eso que los cambios drásticos que ha tenido en las últimas décadas ha tenido consecuencias tan graves como son el aumento de la diabetes y la obesidad. Estos hallazgos también son muy importantes para la conservación biológica y cultural de nuestros recursos alimenticios, porque significan que la dieta mesoamericana en sí misma pudo haber sido un estímulo para el desarrollo de la milpa y la domesticación de sus especies. Y es claro que de ahí en adelante, la cultura alimentaria ha sido un estímulo esencial en la generación de más y más diversidad, tanto biológica como cultural. In the setting of community festivals in the administrative center of the municipality of Zapotitlán de Vadillo, the biologists Alondra Flores, Daniel Sisumbo, and Patricia Colunga, together with a group of local residents, organized an exposition of traditional dishes. During the show, people from Zapotitlán and neighboring communities had the opportunity to re-encounter the dishes that their grandparents' grandparents prepared long ago. While younger people were seeing these ancestral recipes for the first time, older adults may well have recalled them with nostalgia and could, perhaps for the first time in many years, enjoy dishes they had eaten during childhood or even taste some ancient dishes that they had never tried before but that are prepared in neighboring communities. The importance of this event consisted not only in this re-encounter of people in the region with the foods of their ancestors, or in the rescue of those ancient millenarian dishes and archaic technology, but also in the analysis and comprehension of their cultural transcendence and nutritional value. But more than anything else, the significance lies in reincorporating these elements into their own cuisine by adapting them to the rigors of modern life and using technological implements as well as inputs found in their fields, corrals, orchards, natural areas, and markets.
Estamos en un momento clave para que profundicemos en el entendimiento de nuestras dietas tradicionales como un todo, en su valor nutritivo, ecológico y cultural, y que a partir de este entendimiento hagamos políticas públicas. En lugar de satanizar a la comida mexicana como una dieta alta en carbohidratos, rescatemos nuestras cocinas tradicionales que son diversas, nutritivas, sanas y equilibradas. Tenemos en nuestro país una cultura alimentaria con una gran riqueza de recursos milenarios propios, tanto biológicos como culturales. Con ellos podemos hacerle frente a los problemas de salud y pérdida de diversidad que nos aquejan. Es hora de que aceptemos el reto de rescatar, revalorar, recrear y promover la dieta mesoamericana. Thank you.